Hello and welcome back. Thank you so much for staying with us. So we just had a fantastic presentation from Phil, sharing lots of knowledge and insights and some real, real uh, crystal ball moments for opening up what's going to happen um, in the future um, and the important uh, changes that are happening globally um, in terms of the barcode and the QR code. But now, with great excitement, I now have the privilege to introduce Ali Azar, who is the associate product product manager at Tetra Pak, who will be talking to us about the decoding of QR code, which sounds very, very technical. Lots of lots of expertise um, in QR code technology. Ali is going to delve into the significance and advantages of implementing QR codes in our supply chain traceability. Welcome, Ali. Thanks very much for being here with us. Thank you for having me. So before we get started, I normally um, ask uh, the panellists to tell us something interesting uh, about yourself that people might not know. Can you share a secret with us? Well, I watch too many food videos that I'm never going to make. So that's, <laughs> that's something that uh, it has, I've picked up on COVID in the COVID times. Yeah. <laughs> so a, a secret chef wannabe. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. So we're here to talk about QR codes, serialization of QR codes. So I often have customers talking to me um, about <coughs> serialization, unique QR codes. Um, what is it? How does it work? It does it exist? Can you maybe tell us a little bit more in some plain language um, about the benefits of implementing serialized QR codes? All right. Um... First, for a little bit of clarification, serialized unique codes or serialized codes are putting one unique code on every single package. So that means each code will be unique. It could be one, it could be package one, package two, package three, on so on and so forth. Then, if you have a package that is six packs to a box, that aggregation of that code. So you have you can then identify okay, all of these six packages have gone into one major part, uh, secondary package. That's aggregation, and then you have aggregation at a larger level. So when we talk about serialization and unique codes on individual packaging, what we're talking about is basically tracing that individual package. Now, the objectives of tracing that package could be supply chain traceability. You want to know at any given point of time where your package is. It is extremely useful in manufacturing. Uh, for food and beverage, where we're coming from, we want to know traceability, quality problems. For example, is this package okay to release to the market? You want to know how your sustainability footprint is going on. You probably also want to know if this package is unique, if you, if there, if you have problems of counterfeit in your market or uh, gray market imports. And you want to see whether the pocket that you're getting is from an official licensee of that market. You could use individualized serialized codes for counterfeit prevention. And uh, again, it brings visibility to where your package is at any given point of time. In terms of marketing and consumer engagement, what it adds on is visibility to see which consumers are actually scanning that package. So it ties that package to a consumer and gives you real-time information saying, okay, so this package has been scanned. This is the consumption rate. Can I build a loyalty campaign around it? It's a sales incremental tool rather than an engagement tool. So you can, because for each package, you have a proof that this person exactly bought it and it, they're not constantly scanning the same package over and over again. So that's the benefit that you get with a serialized individual package and code. So you can tie things and see where they are in the value chain. Yeah, fantastic. And so actually it's an enhancement of what a QR code can access and bring you. So it, in itself, you don't have to have a serialized QR code to be able to do some marketing. But what you're saying no. is the serialized version allows you to do more things on top of what you could do anyway. Yep. So without serialization, you can do consumer engagement. You could you can talk about uh, you know scan a package, win a prize. You can do you know scan a package, answer some questions, and do stuff like that. But if you want to tie in, for example, scan ten packages and then will loyalty points over a time period, or you need to have certain requirements, and that's a sales promotion tool. So you want to tie in your sales to your marketing campaigns, then you use unique serialized codes. Fantastic. Lots of decoding here, I like it. 
So we can talk about static QR codes, dynamic QR codes, encrypted QR codes. Can you maybe help us understand the definitions of each of those as well? All right. Um, most of us are very familiar with static QR codes. You scan a code and you're sent to either a link, a picture, or an image. That information is permanently recorded. You can't change what happens when you scan that QR code. This, infer this technology is not new. It's been there ever since the QR code was invented, basically. So when you scan a code, that information is permanently printed on that code. You don't need to do much with it. Uh, it's just there. Now, a static code can be the same, or it can be unique as well. For example, every time that you scan a static code, it gives you that information, and it, it's harder to do. You can have individualized packages with static codes on it as well. Dynamic QR codes mean that the information, once you print it, will take you to a URL or somewhere, and you can change the information every time then you scan that code. It could be, and that's related to content. So it's not related to the serialization or anything. It's related to content, what shows up when you scan the code. So that could be unique. That could be non-unique. That could be encrypted. That could be non-encrypted. That could be an image, a post, depending upon the time of day, depending upon the location scan. A consumer could be directed towards different avenues and different areas whatever that the manufacturer would want. So this takes a lot more of active management of the codes. So that's the difference between a static and a dynamic code. And they aren't mutually, ex well, these are mutually exclusive, but the content, for example, can a static code be unique? Yes. Can a static code be the same on all packages? Yes. Can a dynamic code be unique? Yes. So it's a kind of like a grid. You have unique codes and you have uh, non-unique code, basically. And then you have static code, and you have dynamic code, and the applications are across that square. I'm imagining it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it'll make, it'll, it'll make perfect sense. I mean, the, the thing that you need to think about is the objectives of your campaign, I think. Um, and from that, you know, we can we can help guide customers into what's the best solution for them. Um, but obviously, there is a higher amount of information um, that you're able to get if you're using serialized serialized codes. And I think that's kind of the, the biggest piece. You can get involved uh, with connected packaging with standard, uh, static or dynamic code, but you can get involved even more if you're going to do um, serialized or, or unique code. So I think I think that's clear, hopefully. Um, so when it comes to implementing the QR code into packaging, what are the key considerations and challenges that brands, companies should be aware of? Well, I can speak from my experience within the food and beverage. One is the packaging design. Where are you putting the code on the pack? Um, because if you have an exposed code, shelf protection you don't want people scanning in codes in the aisle and then saying oh i won a prize i'm going to take up pick up this package yeah and we've have issues with shelf scanning so there are there are methods to prevent this but there's no foolproof method other than you know just hiding the code or putting it under the cap or doing other methods of saying not exposing the code uh you could also geolocate them isolate them that you can't scan inside the shopping area but where in high population areas and congested areas, very hard to map that area in particular. So where you put the code on the pack is very, very important. And then also, for example, with Tetra Pak, we've got very, very high speed machines. The speed at which you apply the code and the visibility of the code, because if you're using it for traceability purposes, you want that code to be 100% accurate. Uh, we have multiple methods of applying code to the pack. One is from our factories, one is at the customer site. Uh, in the future, we're also looking at nanotechnologies where you make it part of the design and it's invisible on the pack. So how you do that is very, very important. Then, like we said, if, it, if you're using dynamic codes, who is managing the code database? How are you doing it? How are you giving out new code? And if a code has not been read by the customer, how are you managing that? Because you don't want angry customers coming up at your doors and saying, oh, I have a pack. We can't do that. Yeah. Of course, everything's mobile now. So do you want a web app? Do you want a native app? Native apps uh, take more space. It's harder for people to download native apps for a particular purpose. However, if you're using it for traceability, then your distributors and your people involved in the, in the supply chain would 
want a native uh, code in that app. And um, also content updates and maintenance for those codes as well, where they are, how they are doing, if, how, do you, how are you going to get them? How are you going to get people to scan them? Yeah. It's like couponing back in the early days. Uh, coupon scan rates are generally, generally, redemption rates are generally low. And the same thing with engagement campaigns. If the campaign is not well designed, your engagement rates are going to be low. Yeah. But if it's very well designed, then you have op you have opportunities for cheating and fraud because then everybody wants to win that Mercedes out of a pack. So, yes, and that's that's why you need to really think carefully um, in terms of the objective of your campaign and what it is that you're looking to achieve. And there's so so many different um, objectives. It might be around a contest. It might be therefore to to raise sales. It might be education. It might be to get first party information and learn about the consumers. And each of those has a different set of implications. And I think what you're talking about there in terms of, you know, understanding where you want to put the code, of course, is, is, is very um, important as well. Yeah. What, um, what, what would you say uh, TetraPak does in order to support its clients uh, in successfully implementing QR codes? So the first part is for food and beverage manufacturers, we help them identify and work with them on identifying what type of campaigns do they want to run, whether they're loyalty or whether they're consumer engagement campaigns with scan and win, instant scan and wins. Then we work with them to understand what type of code that they would want to use, whether they want to use uh, cryptographically encrypted code for food safety and protection, or do they want to use regular codes? Do they want to use agency codes or any available code or do they want to use specific codes for example do they want to use gs1 codes for example on their food packaging we can we can work with them to actually tell them that yes we can work with gs1 codes then we work with them do they want to have the codes printed at the factory do they want to have them pre-printed on a roll and then integrate that in the, within the system so we have multiple and then we work on the type of campaigns we've done over 40 to 50 campaigns around the world with consumer engagement. And we've had a very successful track record of doing these campaigns. So we can bring our expertise and insights on how you should run the campaign, how should you, you should market it, uh, market it, and what can you do with them, and what will work and what will not work. So if you have any questions around that, reach out to us and we'll see what we can do for you. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 fantastic that obviously we we work with you to deliver these, these campaigns. It's fantastic to all safety that now there's a, a, a nice increase in, in brands realising the potential uh, that they have in order to be able to, to create these connected packaging. Um, but also being able to see some of the stats that we're able to, to, to achieve. So, you know, two, three minutes engagement time is not unusual. Uh, we've seen between 20 to 30% increase in sales. So there's lots of really oh. nice things that we've been able um, to see. What do you think, um, in terms of consumer engagement, QR codes um, can provide the value, the most valuable, um, the most valuable experience for customers? Or, or is there a specific case study that you uh, can share? All right. Um, a little to add on to my previous comment as well. We work with agencies to provide the engaging front end uh, of the experience because see, we are a manufacturing unit and we help manufacturers put the code on the pack. But the consumer journey that happens, we can guide you along with it. But it is, at the end of the day, people like Jenny and agency that derives the creative inputs on how well a campaign will go. So it works hand in hand. And this comes on to, you know, what insights and what digital experiences can you do? It really matters to what you're doing with that code and how are you working with your digital partner or digital agency to, to derive the experience. If you're giving out USBs and caps, and expecting people to scan four times for a USB and cap, that's probably not going to work. That's why you need to leverage experience from, you know, what's the consumer journey through this and how you're going to, what kind of prizes are you giving out? What kind of experience are you going to do? Is it an augmented reality experience? Or are you really going to say, we're going to do scan as many packs as you can. And at the end, you can win a PS5. Of course, Mercedes or anything like that. It really depends on the kind of campaign that you're running. And that is depending upon the kind of area that you're in and kind of the, what's your objective? It comes back to your marketing objective at the end of the day. If you want to boost engagement, you'd probably say scanner pack. 
and uh, post this post uh, photo to Facebook, share it with 10 of your friends. And then, you know, you can be part of our win, a, win six packs of our cool new product design. However, if you want to increase sales, you'll say, scan this unique serialized pack. And then after the end of the paper, the person who scanned the most will win a PS5. So it depends upon the objective. We've had a customer in Mexico do a launch campaign with our unique codes, and they were targeting a 5% sales increase. But because of the marketing campaign that was built around it, and they had uh, about $100,000 in Amazon prizes based on the number of scans that you do after answering a couple of prizes, it had an 80% sales increase versus the same period last year. It's just wow. the way that you were doing the prizes. This is by, I would have to say, this is unique. This is unique w even within our world. However, eight to 20% sales increases depending upon how you're running the campaign and about the same for engagement purposes. If you have, you know, that's a standard statistic that we can measure across, across the benchmark. And, that, and we've seen that depending upon what you're doing, 8% more common, eight to 12%, 20, 25%, you need a really good agency and you need to work with like a really good objective for people to actually come in and scan. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. We can't be saying that 80% increase in sales is the, is the average, but that's amazing. Um, you know, but again, normally what we see on average is, is, is 20%. And, you know, we just had a campaign, uh, finish up with, with, with Chetra that I talked about, um, in the beginning as well, we have 30% increase in sales, but, these types of numbers are possible, but yeah. We're not promising them because it, it's unique. Never it depends on the, yeah, it depends on what everybody else is doing at the time as well. So we're not promising, to, you know, you promised me 30%. It yeah. really depends on the customer journey, where they are, external factors, tons of things come into play. Yeah. But yeah, we've had good experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So that's, that, you know, a really nice set of case study and a nice set of stats that, that you're talking about there. What do you see um things that gonna move forward obviously we're seeing that there are more brands getting involved um what do you see as, as, as kind of the the future advancement um in qr code technology um i've mentioned one one is the invisible code so mm -hmm. you won't see where the code is on the pack basically so we're moving towards you know fingerprint technologies and stuff like that. So that's not directly related to QR codes, but it's related to codification of packaging in general. Yeah. Uh, in terms of QR code, that would go back to the people who are developing the code and what they're doing. It Maybe the same QR, you have different layers and I've heard companies working with different layers of QR code so that if a distributor scans it without a user profile or an application, they get different information. If a consumer scans it, they get different information depending on how they're using it. So you could have different insights and enhanced insights on the type of scans and the type of things that you're doing. What's actually coming is how are you going to integrate it with your internet of things? Maybe your fridge has a scanner that if you pull out the last milk package out of your fridge or you have got one left in your fridge and then you can order one directly off Amazon if it's connected to the internet of things maybe, and you know, have less of your time actually going out and making product lists and grocery shopping and it just comes automatically to your door. Of course, that also brings into the question of privacy and consumer data and GDP, and that will then also be at the next wave on how and what data do you want to be shared or if not, want, do you want to be part of it or not? So what type of data is being shared? How much of your personalized data do you want to be actually out there? but it's always a give and take. So for example, if you want personalized recommendation insights, you'll have to give out your personalized data. If you want you know, Amazon to send you stuff without you going to the market, you'll have to give them access to that kind of technology. So uh, I see that it'll be a mix and match with the uh, innovation and early adopters going for, you know, let hey, give us everything. I don't want to get up off the couch versus the laggard thing. Okay, I want a more private experience and how can I use this to have maintain my privacy while I want the same benefits that these other guys are getting? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I, you know, I think there's going to be a lot there in terms of artificial intelligence and obviously our, our Google assistants and whatever other assistants that e Echo and Amazon and all those types of things that, that we're relying on. I can see very quickly how that can, that can move forward. But if we don't yeah. look so far, 
uh, into the future and we just look at um, maybe what's happening now. Is there any particular market where you see um, more connected packaging campaigns than others? Yes, uh, we've got the Americas, which is basically you've got you've got Mexico, South America. This is a big market for us uh, in terms of connected packaging. You've also got APAC, where because of the integration that they have with WeChat and the other, uh, because that's a payment provider as well as anything, mm -hmm. it the more the industry is connected, the more the people are more used to digitalized experiences the easier it is for QR code adoption to actually pick up in those markets. So the Asia Pacific market, as well as the other, uh, the, the South American markets are very, very interested in, in, in these connected package experiences. Sure. And do you think that there's any other market that's going to um, catch up, run to catch up? Yes, the, the European and the Middle Eastern markets or the African markets, of course, that's those are the markets that uh, they will catch up, but they've got their, because of the distribution and the kind of customers, because you've got all, all sorts of customers in these markets, you still got paper money being used and, you know, uh, physical currencies and coins being used in Germany and in these markets. Uh, and the quest towards digitization also comes in. Where are they along their digitalization journey uh, in these markets? Have they moved to paperless, uh, in, uh, in, as a paperless economy or a cash? That will also, that tells you where they are. Are they more comfortable in using QR codes? Mm, for mm. example, for example, India, uh, everyone from the street vendor to the highest office, they've got those QR codes on their on their carts and everything, saying that, hey, scanner code, if you want to make a payment, don't give me physical cash, it's harder to manage. Give me give it to me in my digital bank account. Those show that, yeah, they're open to connected experiences. They're open to using QR codes and therefore they can be moved towards advanced, more advanced uh, technologies. Yeah, no, definitely. And I mean, if you look at some of the different, you talked about um, South America, also LATAM, for example, I know that um, there's some really interesting things going on in terms of dynamic pricing uh, in Brazil, for example, uh, depending on the expiry date. So again, some really interesting things there as it becomes closer to the expiry date, the, the price of the product automatically um, gets cheaper. That's super interesting. And I, I think the reduction in waste is something like 40%. So, yep. um, you know, really, really, really high. There's also digital invoicing um, in Spain. Mercadona, one of the uh, leading um, supermarkets, has just implemented um, digital receipts, which I think is really interesting as well. So there's quite a lot of new um, developments happening in some of these markets. Yep. And uh, so where I'm based, I'm based out of Sweden. We've got digital invoicing already, but they're based out of the barcode that you're reading. Whereas if you want individualized QR code based, you know, will the barcode, will the QR code replace the barcode as a standard on pack code? Time will tell. We don't really know at this point of time. But of course, you've got more information coming out of the QR code than you're getting out of the barcode at this point of time. However, a lot of systems need to change. Retailers, yeah. distributors, wholesalers. Somebody was mentioning in the previous presentation that, you know, we've got the barcodes in the 70s and the scanners. You need to change a lot of hardware and a lot of, a lot of software to move towards new technologies. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. But there's lots of, lots of opportunity to really kind of take advantage of the technology now. You don't have to wait yeah. for the retailers to, to, to change i mean it's so the much best thing about it is the mobile penetration because now everything is on mobile and everybody almost has a mobile phone with a camera so with due to that i think the tech it becomes easier along the way yeah 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 yeah, yeah. definitely um quick question actually from the audience which is what is the biggest benefit of having serialized qr codes um identifying a unique pack is basically sales promotion or to to find out what we've done is that in terms of depending upon what your objective is the biggest benefit of a serialized unique code is to see where your package is at any given point of time within the value chain for a supplier manager um, for the marketing team or the sales team is direct sales promotion because if you say if you have a the same qr code on every single pack instead of a unique qr code a person can go and scan one package 10 times versus that if you have a unique code, you know that that is the same package being scanned 10 times. So that doesn't add to your loyalty points. 
So yeah. depending upon who you are, are you the guy looking at, okay, I want to know where my package is, what was the distribution channel, who scanned it at the end, what's the value chain traceability? Oh, something went wrong with this particular package at this particular shop, you need serialized unique codes. Whereas for marketing, oh, I'm just concerned with sales promotion and I want to increase my overall sales consumption, then you're looking at serialized unique codes. Other than these two areas, you're probably looking at a static code and you're looking at SKU level information or brand level information or generic market engagement campaigns where you're not too much concerned about packaging and you're more in concerned about engagement and other areas. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. So again, comes back to what is it that you want uh, yeah. to be able to make sure that you're getting the right solution. Um, we've got some more questions here. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Mr. Ali. I have some few questions for you. Are there any scalability concerns when using serialized QR codes for large scale implementations? Nope. Um, so like I, when, when I went back to it, it depends on the type of, the QR code is the visual representation of the code at the back end. Now, Tetra Pak has, uh, 16 digit in cryptograph military grade encryption on its code. And we've done we've done campaigns with a billion codes or two billion codes with each code being absolutely unique. You'd probably take a long time. I'm not saying impossible because this is technology. You take a very, very long time to crack that uh, algorithm. So depending upon how you generate the code that is within the data that is within the QR code, uh, the QR code just visually represents what putting in there. So the alphanumeric or the website or the way that you encrypt that is, and the algorithm that you use, that's where expertise and how much is it worth it to you. For example, if you're doing government level, level code, of course, you probably want to go with the high-end algorithm to generate those codes. And then you want to identify, all right, product types based on that. That's for government level, you know, Whereas if you're doing a regular engagement campaign where the and you're giving out USBs and caps, then you could probably go with a random number generator and generate unique codes and not have to worry about uh, those codes being, you know, broken into. Does yeah. that answer your question? Yeah. No, 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 definitely, definitely. The next question is what backup and redundancy systems are in play in case the QR code data is lost or corrupted? Uh, we have a... So Tetra Pak has a backend claim management system where, for example, if a code cannot be read for some particular reason or it has been lost for some particular reason, we can, for customers and consumers, we can do claim management. Of course, that needs to be investigated. Is this an official buy? And they need to provide proof of purchase, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whereas we have our web servers, we have our uh, services that are up and they have backups in the, in the cloud and the system to per ensure that once the data is being uploaded, it's not lost. Uh, and we've got our IT professionals working on that to ensure that the data is being sent, backed up, and uh, it's being made available. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Um, and then lastly, how are serialized QR codes integrated with existing systems or databases for tracking purposes? If you use a standard, if you use like the GS1 standard, the GS1 standard indicates based off my basic knowledge, of course, you had an expert here right before me. Uh, it indicates that this is the kind of data that should be present that comes into the protocol, basically. So if you're using unique serialized codes, again, the code is just a visual representation. The QR code is a graphic representation of the code, the, the alphanumeric code. The alphanumeric code, of course, contains information which is based on a standard. So depending upon what standard are you using, are you using a GS1 standard? Are you using a localized standard or whatever data? So that's how the system works. You could use any visualizer to visualize the QR code. It could be a QR code version two, three, depending upon the size, et cetera. But the alphanumeric code and the information that it contains, that really matters on what type of standardized solution that you're using. For example, if your traceability chain uses a particular standard, let's just say it uses XYZ standard and you want data to be in a particular format, then you will tell us that, okay, this is the data that we want in this particular format. Please generate the QR codes in that particular area. That's fine, not an issue. It really comes down to that 16 digit or, the 20, or that eight digit alphanumeric code that you're generating and what kind of data that goes into that. Yeah, 
Yeah, definitely, definitely. And also, you know, connecting to uh, CRM systems, API to other systems, that's something that we can we can take care of. Uh, we just need to know about it before before we start. Well, thank you so much, Ali. It's been great talking to you. I hope that a lot of people have been able to decode the mythical information around QR codes. And um, hopefully they have a much better understanding um, of all the different options that are open to them. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Have a nice day. And you. And so we are almost about to wrap things up, but we have one more one more hang tight we're not done yet we will be back in just a few minutes we'll be back at 55 and the reason we'll be back is we'll be talking about pharmaceuticals with Sim simran banjuri head of packaging development at takada pharmaceuticals and ryan killy who is director of market development at epac flexible packaging stand by let's hear about connected solutions in pharmaceuticals in just a few minutes